Okay, so this is the beginning of chapter two. We're just doing sections 2.1 to 2.3 today. Um, and the first section here is on the atomic theory of matter. Um, we're gonna kind of go through some important principles and then how the model of the atom was discovered essentially. So um, we have actually finally gotten to the level where we can see atoms. This is um, a very recent picture of iodine atoms on the surface of platinum metal. We got it using a technique called STM, or you might have heard of SEM, scanning electron microscope. This is scanning tunneling microscope. <laughs> okay, so this really is getting us to now be able to see on the atomic level, which is brand new, okay? So we can see images on the atomic level. Again, insane. So I have this little movie. Okay, hopefully you can hear this, um, but this is the world's smallest movie. You guys get the idea. So these are actually individual atoms, which is really interesting. If we can do something like that, like a stop motion animation with taking pictures of atoms. That's going to be extremely relevant in the future. But anyway, moving on. So the modern atomic theory. So there's a lot that's brought us to the modern atomic theory, but there's a couple of laws that are extremely important. First being the law of conservation of mass. I know you all know the law of conservation of mass, which has to do with there we go. Matter cannot be created or destroyed, right? Matter cannot be created or destroyed. This actually governs um, almost everything we do in chemistry. Because matter can't be created or destroyed, we can actually calculate how much stuff we're supposed to make whenever we do a chemical reaction or things like that. Um, so this is just an example here. When wood burns, right? Wood burns and it uses oxygen. And then we end up with ashes, carbon dioxide gas, and water vapor. Okay, and the mass of the oxygen used and the wood will equal the mass of the ashes, carbon dioxide, and water. Now, this is really hard to do because we would have to actually capture all of the gases being produced. We would have to know how much oxygen was used to burn. Um, but these would be equal, would be equal, if we could capture everything, we could capture, okay? Um, so keep that in mind when we start doing math and stoichiometry, it's gonna be important that the law of conservation of matter or mass comes into play. Okay, there's a couple other laws that govern exactly what we see in chemistry. The first being the law of definite proportions, um, which has to do with what it sounds like. The law of definite proportions has to do with proportions or ratios. And essentially, it says that any given compound, so all samples of any given compound will have the same proportion or ratio, will have the same proportion of elements. Okay, so if you look at the picture example here, 1A with eight Bs makes nine Cs, law of conservation of mass. And then if I double it, then two As would have to join with 16 Bs in order to make 18 Cs. Okay, so that's always gonna be a ratio or a proportion. 
real life application, if I'm talking about water anywhere in the world, if I have a pure water sample, it is always 88.8% .8 of the mass is oxygen and the 11.2% is hydrogen, always. Okay, so if it's water, it's that same proportion. Okay, so the other law is the law of multiple proportions. And if you kind of think about what the name of the law means, this means that there can be different or multiple proportions, okay? Water is H2O, but you can have a different proportion of hydrogen to oxygen. You could do um, hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2, which is a completely different formula. It has different percentages, um, but it is still a combination of hydrogen and oxygen. So this is a law of multiple proportions. Essentially, nitrogen and oxygen can combine to make all of these different types of molecules, NO, NO2, N2O. So they can, they can combine in different ratios. Um, the law of multiple proportions says, However, that elements can combine in more than one way, like we just are looking at right now. So elements can combine in more than one way. Though they are always going to be related, okay? So like nitrogen oxygen, NO is related to NO2. Um, in some type of integer ratio. So elements can combine in more than one way. They will always be related through an integer ratio. And I'm gonna do an example here in a moment, okay? Um, but if you do the mass ratios of them, um, you're always gonna get a whole number ratio because nitrogen and oxygen, it's the same elements being used, all right? So here's an example. Okay, it says consider two separate compounds that are formed by only carbon and oxygen. Okay, so carbon and oxygen can make multiple compounds. We know we can have CO2. Uh, you can also have CO, carbon monoxide. Um, it says the first compound has 42.9% carbon and 57.1% oxygen by mass. And the second has 27.3% carbon and 72.7% oxygen by mass. Okay, so different percentages, both carbon and oxygen. Is this consistent with the law of multiple proportions? So to test that, what we need to do is we need to find the ratio of carbon to oxygen or oxygen to carbon for each of the compounds. So I'm going to look at the first one. And it is 57.1% oxygen to 42.9% carbon. Okay, so if I actually divide those, I get that this is a 1.33 gram ratio. And then if I do the second one, 72.7% oxygen to 27.3% carbon, that is a 2.66 gram ratio. Now you might already be able to tell 2.66 and 1.33, those are gonna be able to give us a whole number ratio, but to actually check, you compare the ratios, 1.33, and you get two, which is a whole number, okay? So any combination of carbon and oxygen should be able to give you a whole number ratio. And if not, then it doesn't follow the law of multiple proportion. So it will, um, otherwise you probably did the math wrong. So if it follows the law of multiple proportions, anytime you have different combinations of the same elements.